Hi, Dr. David. Hey, Tammy. It's so nice to be here tonight. It, I'm grateful you're subbing in. So for those of you that are watching this on, um, on the, the recording, this is the, normally the live Q&A with Dr. Rob, but this will be the live Q&A with Dr. David Fawcett, so, uh, who is, is our colleague and, and is um, on the clinical team for the Seeking Integrity Los Angeles Treatment Program. So I'll let him do an introduction, but then for those of you joining us live, please, if you have questions about you know, sex addiction, intimacy disorders, co-occurring addiction, whatever, um, please put it in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and we will answer those to the best of our ability. So the chat, if you would say for, um, uh, uh, if, you have a, uh, if you have a comment, um, um, I will add resources. If Dr. David mentions a resource, um, we'll put that in the chat as well, so. Great, okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, as Tammy mentioned, uh, I'm David Fawcett. I am the Vice President for Clinical Programming and Seeking Integrity. Uh, I'm kind of the co-creator of the clinical program with Dr. Rob. I do a lot of the co-occurring, as Tammy mentioned, uh, particularly what we call chemsex as, as a shorthand term, but it's that fusion of uh, drugs of any kind, amphetamines, alcohol, opioids, with sexual behavior of one form or another. And when those two things get bonded together, uh, it really creates one addictive system. We find a lot of people coming to us with recovery from drugs and alcohol, sometimes for, for years, but their pornography or their sex addiction has gotten out of control. And so we, we look at the whole, the whole story. And so it's a pleasure to be here and see what fun questions come my way. Since there aren't questions yet, I've had a number of people lately asking about cannabis use and also, in fact, I was talking to somebody earlier today and they, they talked about they, they were using cannabis for pain um, uh, they, they had some chronic pain and they were using that, but they also saw that as being kind of a gateway or trigger to, to the sexual acting out. Um, and, and we've, I've had, um, uh, questions about, you know, smoking and nicotine and, you know, is that really a problem? So could you, until we have questions, address a couple of those, um, points for me, please? Sure. So, um. Cannabis. Uh, cannabis uh, is a very commonly used drug associated with sex. Uh, a lot of people use it to relax, almost as, as common as alcohol sometimes. And, and so we do see it very frequently paired with uh, sexual behavior, whether it's porn or sexual acting out, uh, or as part of the ritual leading up to it. Somebody might, might, and this is another thing we talk at our clients is seeking integrity about is this the kind of long tail of ritual, which can start seemingly disconnected from the acting out, but it's little things. It's going on your phone, it's feeling lonely, it's um, feeling bored, uh, and you know, gradually getting into things, and then alcohol and marijuana are often part of that, that story. So yeah, a, a marijuana is, is a powerful drug. Um, there are a lot of, uh, it's being kind of rebranded right now because it is approved in so many states, either medically or for recreational use, and uh, for uh, addicts, that can be a problem. Uh, we know that for young brains of all sorts, uh, marijuana is a real problem drug. It truly is the gateway drug and it really does affect brain development. So I have concerns about marijuana in general. But to, to take it back to uh, another drug that Tammy, you mentioned that is even considered more benign, but I think is equally kind of um, uh, bad is, is nicotine. And uh, people on the, on the webinar here may know that at Seeking Integrity, we ask all our clients to quit smoking if they are smokers, <clears throat> because we believe that to allow somebody to go through our program, including perhaps uh, drug and alcohol abstinence, but not have nicotine out of the picture, does a real disservice. And we know that because nicotine, the way it works in the brain, it works in this midbrain uh, section, the limbic system, that, that is exactly where addiction lives. And uh, it keeps the brain kind of primed and ready to take off for bigger and better things. But if you quit everything else, but have cigarettes or nicotine of whatever form uh, on board, it really does keep your brain kind of on idle in terms of an addict addiction mode. So we are asking all our clients to, to get off it. We really believe that's by far the better, the better choice for people. And I had somebody the other day talk about, well, shouldn't I quit you know, some of the other things and you know, kind of take them in the, the worst problematic order, you know, and then worry about it. And, you know, what is, what are your thoughts on, you know, is that, is that a viable option or 
is it better to, you know, kind of rip the bandaid off and just go? You know, I, um, when I got into my own recovery, I um, had given up nicotine thinking that was my problem and the other alcohol and drugs just kind of a, along for the ride. But guess what? I finally had to get sober, clean and sober. But I, and I picked up cigarettes again with just that logic, thinking that's well, not as bad as. But on my first anniversary, as a gift to myself, I quit everything. And I, I believe it's just torture um, to just lay off one after another. I think just get it all over with. In a couple of weeks, you're detoxed, you're ready to go, and you're totally feeling much better. So I, I really believe in doing it all at once. Yeah, my, my thought is always if I'm, like you said, if I'm keeping things on idle, I'm also not really happy, joyous, and free. So, um, so, so I personally agree. But okay, we have questions. How does a couple restart to have sex beyond gentle touch kissing after the essay partner becomes abstinent? It sounds counterintuitive to start a, a sexual spark desire when that's what the essay is trying to control. Thank you. You know, that's a really great question. That's, as of course, it's a natural one. And I think th there's some phases that a couple has to go through. One is to uh, obviously just start to rebuild that trust and that may take time. And I think often we found that the, the, uh, the addict and the partner are often on very different timetables in terms of what is acceptable and that the partner often um, not feeling comfortable or, or trusting uh, as soon as the, as the uh, sex addict might <clears throat> want to feel that way. So, so it's a, it's a, in that sense, it's really highly individualized. And that's why we always recommend a lot of support for both the partner and the addict in terms of dealing with feelings and things. Um, but, but bravo for you for, for trying to want to sort of recommit. Um, and it, it really takes trust. It takes vulnerability. It takes a lot of communication and, and, and a lot of um, practice, frankly, because it's awkward. And, uh, and there's a lot of uh, hesitation, I think. Um, I really like an exercise um, by Masters and Johnson called Sensate Focus. Um, it's a strange name, S-E-N-S-A-T-E, Focus, meaning simply a focus on the senses. And what it does, it's a, it's a couple's communication exercise, a sensual exploration exercise where there's a uh, pleasurer and a receiver, if you will, and, and they take turns. And so there may be 10 or 15 minutes of the pleasurer um, and keep in mind, this is a, not a sexual exercise in the beginning. It's a, it's a central communication. So everywhere but the genitalia, so you may, you may kiss, you may stroke, you may tickle, you may caress and rub, and uh, you know, the arms, the shoulders, the feet, the back, every, everywhere except um, sexual areas. And, and the idea is for the, the receiver to give feedback, um, expressing, gee, I like that, I don't like that, um, too much, too little, <clears throat> and, it, and it builds this kind of dialogue in a way that, that is a workaround from addiction, because addiction is all up here, right? It's all fantasies and scripts and, and or it's anxiety and emotions. And this really is just a, a non-stressful, very pleasurable way of starting to communicate with each other in a non-threatening way and reestablish some of that sensual connection. And, and that really then from there, it provides a really nice foundation toward more meaningful you know, sexual encounters. But I think it's really, it's, it's all about really taking it slow. I mean, we work a lot with our uh, sex addicts and treatment on, on developing empathy and reestablishing that ability to understand what their partner is going through. And, and, you know, it takes a lot of that consciousness as well. But I really do like that sensei focus. It's by Masters and Johnson. If you Google it, it's, it's all over the Google. Uh, you'll, you'll find it out there. Um, and it's a, it's a really great exercise. Been around a long time. I put it in the chat so you can copy and paste it out of the chat if you would like. So, okay. The next question. Um, oops, I think, I'll oh, hear you. Okay, do you believe that having a sponsor is imperative for someone in recovery from SA? How might one go about finding a sponsor mentor when all the groups are done virtually and it's um, trickle to form, or tr trickier to form interpersonal relationships? Yeah, it's another really great question. And I, I do believe a sponsor is, is essential. You know, the, any addiction, but I think especially sex addiction and porn addiction, uh, which I include in that same rubric, uh, it, you know, it's all about uh, accountability. And I think we need to be transparent and we need to be accountable to someone. And um, so having that is just critical. I think for a daily check-in and having hopefully multiple people to whom we're accountable, it may be a therapist, it may be um, our partners, it may be our sponsor uh, or a group around us. But I think that relationship is really key. And it's, it's, and it's also for accountability. I think 
we need, uh, as recovering individuals, somebody that we can relate to, who can provide maybe some guidance, who can share their experience, um, who's not a therapist, but more of a peer. And I think that's, that's really an essential part of the equation toward, toward recovery. Um, now, I, I really understand what you're saying about with everything on Zoom right now, it's particularly difficult to find a sponsor, um, or it's, it's just different perhaps. Uh, a lot of the meetings I attend online um, do uh, have a way to reach out if you're looking for a sponsor, looking for a temporary sponsor. And, and that's the other thing I wanna say about sponsorship is that so many people, um, this is in normal times uh, too, uh, kind of look for the perfect sponsor and they, they put it off and this one's you know, too, too tall, that was too short, it's like the Goldilocks thing, right? And, yeah. and so I think we need to, um, it's better to have a sponsor than the perfect sponsor. And by the way, the perfect sponsor is not out there, but, but it's not a marriage, you know, it's not a lifetime commitment. But so even if you have to get a temporary sponsor, I think it's just so important to have that. And then while you have a temporary one, at least you can look around and see who might, um, who you, who you might like to work with. Um, what I always recommend to my clients is to look around, listen, you know, who's, who's saying what at the meetings? And does that person have something that sounds good to you, that, that you would like to be? You know, does that, do you relate to that? Um, and I think in um, some uh, online messages, you can, you can even message that person. So I think there's, there's ways to reach out and, and kind of back channel on the communication. But I think, yeah, it's, it's harder these days, like, like everything, right? But, but I think uh, it's really important to, to get a sponsor and to find someone that you can work with because you know, a, a critical part of recovery too is working the steps. And, and that really is done uh, largely under the, the auspices of a sponsorship, sponsorship relationship. So yeah, I mean, um, yeah. So uh, my thoughts too on yeah, that are, please, like please. you said, it's not, you know, it's not a forever, you know, it's like, who do you think can help you through this first, this first or this second phase or whatever, you know, if you look at it as increments, it's like, they can help me on this, you know, on this part of the journey. And then if I'm going to reevaluate. And now I, mean, I know lots of people who have outgrown that sponsor, but that they gave them a great foundation on which to build. And now you need somebody, you know, cause you've changed along the way and, and you have a better idea of what you are and what your goals are and things like that. So that's all good. Um, I, you know, I think it's, I think in some ways it's easier. I'm gonna put that challenge out there that it's easier because in person you have to go up to a person and they could reject you in person. And this, you can put it out there in the entire meeting. It's like, hey, I'm looking for a sponsor. Who's, who is sponsoring, you know, can I give you a call? You know, like if you can get some numbers and call them after the, you know, after the meeting and just have a conversation and say, this is what I'm looking for. Tell me about your sponsorship style and what the expectations. And I think having clear expectations on both both sides you know if you're some sponsors go I, I want you to call me every day or text me or whatever and if that's not your thing like don't pick that person if you go hey that would be good accountability I will do that so you know it, it's no harm no foul but I would say if you change sponsors have the integrity to tell the other one thank you you know thank you for what you've taught me you know I've decided to move to this one don't just ghost them so that's my right. Right. And, and, you know, two sponsors is not better than one, you know, right? Because you can triangulate so easily. So really, it's a serial relationship. You go yes. from one to the, to the next. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I agree. But, but I, I've heard too many people that they just quit. They quit going to that meeting. They quit calling that person. I'm like, just be honest with them. It's like, right. you know, you just. And, and I think it's also really important to explore what that, that mutuality you're talking about, Tammy, right? So, so somebody, a sponsor may want to just communicate by text once a day, or somebody else might be really more hands-on and phone calls or meeting a person when we can. And, and so there's different styles and intensity, and I think it has to be a match in that level too. But these are all skills that are so important to develop in any kind of relationship. So, so it's good to learn how to end gracefully. It's good to learn how to, it's, it, you know, you're not dating your sponsor, but, you, but there is some selection in there. And, you know, I think all of those, like, you don't have to find the perfect sponsor the first try. You know, they can, if they can tide you over till you find, you know, the next phase, great. So, okay. Now, oops, sorry. Next question. 
Uh, Dr. David, can you please talk about your online drop-in groups for men, how they work, who can join, et cetera? Uh, sure. Um, so I have a group very similar to this um, uh, on sex and relationship healing on Wednesday evenings, same time, 5 Pacific, 8 Eastern. It's called Just Addiction and Recovery Q&A. Uh, it's exactly like the same format. I just do a little bit of um, teaching about a topic, usually for 10 minutes or so at the beginning of that one. But otherwise, it's the same format. And then I do want to mention on Tuesdays on In the Rooms, uh, I have a chemsex recovery group. Um, and that's um, really cool because uh, it's really hard to find a place, even in different fellowships, where people can talk about the relationship between drugs and sex. And so we're getting people from all over the world in that meeting. So feel free to drop in there, too, if that's your thing. Um, and then I'll just put in a plug, uh, Friday evening, starting um, this Friday, hopefully, we're do I'm doing a four-week series. Uh, this is not a drop-in group, it's more of an addiction webinar on chemsex or co-occurring uh, substance use disorders. There's more information about that on our, on our site. Yes, I will add that to the site. So, so in the chat, um, I've added the in the rooms, but uh, so yes, David just mentioned the interactive webinar series on seekingintegrity.com. Um, there is, uh, the, we just started another series on Sunday for men, the drop-in, well, it's not drop-in, it's a work group for working through the Sex Addiction 101 workbook. Uh, so that's another uh, group of guys that are, are starting the level one. We'll be offering another one probably in September. So, you know, watch for information on that. The couple's a lecture series will be starting August 22nd with Dr. Rob. So, so check out the online resources. Uh, they're typically 90 minute sessions. Those are fee based, but we have on sex and relationship healing.com lots and lots of resources all free like this, the drop in groups um, uh, podcast. There's three different series, including David's podcast series. Um, all on that site. So, and I know some of those drop-in groups. Um, for those of you looking for sponsors, I know that they do connect, and and multiple, you know, of them are staying connected outside of the group. So they are, you know, becoming, you know, sponsors or peer sponsors, you know, from that, uh, from those connections as well. So. So, okay, next question. My husband has been in recovery since January from porn addiction. He is really trying now, but I just can't get over the fact that he will go sometimes six months without any intimacy with me. I am assuming that means sex with me. When I ask he why he chose porn over me, he doesn't have an answer. Any advice on how I can get past this? Right. Well, you know, your feelings are, are totally understandable and, and very natural and, and kind of the way most partners react. Um, if you consider, you know, everything you thought you knew about him was suddenly changed and the rug was pulled out from under you, um, it's, uh, that experience can range from incredibly painful to actually traumatic. And so, um, yeah, I mean, your, your experience is, is a typical. Um, I, what we really recommend and, and find a lot of value with is um, both the partner and the uh, addict having some professional help to get some support really. So CSATs are often the best kind of therapists that are trained to handle this and we recommend each partner uh, and uh, uh, addict have their own CSAT to talk about these things. And I think a lot of this will have to do with um, getting you the, the tools you need to, to help support you in this. It's about you establishing your own healthy connections outside of the marriage. I'm talking about a support group for you, um, which we have here at Sex Relationship Healing or, or in person groups as well, where you can talk with, with other people who have gone through this experience and, and help kind of share notes on their way. But I think in my experience, it just there's a couple of magic elements here. One is time, um, one is, is communication, and one is connection. And a connection meaning not just with your husband, but with, uh, with your, your support group as well. And really um, processing those feelings because there are a lot of feelings that you have to um, express, uh, feel better about, and then reestablish safety. Uh, and by that, I mean emotional safety within the marriage. And that, that takes time. And, and every time, um, it's not unusual for every time a partner looks at her, all they can think of is that betrayal, right? It's, just, it's like imprinted at a, at a really deep level. And so uh, it may take time and just um, and patience and some understanding and some boundaries and, and all those things that we talk about in, 
in recovery groups. But um, I would just keep at it. I think with the taking care of yourself in terms of um, the, those connections and the support, making sure you have a place to talk about your stuff besides him uh, is going to be really helpful for you. Tammy? And I know, yeah, I, I get these questions all the time. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the challenge is um, when we're talking about sex addiction, porn addiction, all of those types of things, we're talking about lack of intimacy. And I don't mean sex. It's, the, it's, the, it's easier to numb out and go look at, if we're an addict, to go look at porn. It's easier to to fantasize, it's easier to have disconnected body part, you know, sex than it is to be vulnerable with somebody we care about. So, so it's really challenging. And while it feels so personal for the partners, you know, it, 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 whether it's alcohol or you know some other chemical or porn, it's looking to do that or food. It's the same result that we're looking for is to is to escape you know, what's uncomfortable, you know, to us. So, so, you know, he probably can't even say why he chose that. You, like that, that takes a lot of, of education and time. So I'm thrilled you're here. I invite you, there's a betrayed partner group at 1230 Wednesday. It's a drop-in group for betrayed partners, 1230 Wednesday Pacific time. Uh, there was one last night at 6 p.m. Um, uh, you know, I subbed in, it was a great group of very supportive people. So, so I invite you to, you know, to pick some of those things, but educate yourself. There's a ton of podcasts on sex and relationship healing.com these webinars this is all to help you understand understand what you're what you're up against quite frankly you know but but it isn't just an, an addict brain chooses completely different than a normal brain it's like so compulsive so i've got to do this and it doesn't make any sense to normal right. people and, and i want to say i know how this is exactly how it feels right of course it yeah. feels like he chose porn over you but but exactly what tammy said with the addict brain with that dopamine rush it's that's not the choice he made. He was, for all the lack of intimacy and other issues, no doubt, let it made him vulnerable to the, the like overwhelming super stimulation appeal of porn or, or in other cases, sex or cocaine or, you know, people fall for different things. But I know it feels, of course, it feels like it, you know, and in reality it was, I guess, but, it, but that's not, that wasn't the conscious process on his part. Right. And until an addict has tools to choose differently, like it's like you don't have a choice, you know. So so once once they have education, once they have tools to support it, you know, once you get sober from whatever it is, you know, like now it would be a choice if I chose to go back out, you know, at, at first I couldn't stop, you know, and, and, and as crazy as that is, I and mean, that's unfortunately just how our brains work. We can learn to do things differently. There is lots of hope. Um, I invite you, like Dr. David said, time, support for you, education, just really dig into the resources on sex and relationship healing.com too. So, okay. So, um, what are some things you can recommend to help the formal disclosure process along? After a lengthy, staggered disclosure, we still haven't begun the formal process and face questions from our therapists about why it's important to do so. And actual work towards this process has yet to begin. What can the betrayed partner do to help the addict face what is incredibly triggering and justifiably scary? Okay, so... Uh, hmm. So the formal disclosure is just that, right? It's a very formal process that, that does take a lot of preparation and time and consideration. We don't recommend, um, there's no perfect timetable for that, but we don't recommend doing it right away. Um, but I think usually in, in a matter of some months, without dragging on too long, it would be probably normal to do it. Uh, both, both the partner and the addict have their own therapist, typically or own representative, if you will, sometimes a couple's, counselor as well. Um, and it's a very formal thing in terms of uh, things being written up, a chance to ask questions on the part of the partner and, and all this. So uh, it, it does take a lot of preparation. Um, I'm not sure how long that's gone on. I'm not sure why um, uh, it may be taking time. I do know that it, it takes a lot of build up in terms of preparation, especially in the part of the, the addict, I think to um, be ready to uh, face uh, the, the reality of, of some of the, the emotions that, that happen in the disclosure process. Of course, the partner wants to know 
um, what's going on. So I think we owe it to the partners to have it happen in a fairly efficient manner. Um, so um, I'm not sure that you can. You, you're, you say, what can the betrayed partner do to help the addict face the incredibly triggering and just just rather scary you know, process? Um, I'm not sure that's your job, frankly. I think um, he needs to be able to go through that um, and, and prepare for it on his own. It, it does help, of course, to know that you're, um, I guess, receptive to what he has to say. Um, but I think uh, I'm not sure that you can help it along. I, I think that really, honestly, that's the role of the, the professionals in the, in the mix. So, um, uh, tell me, what would you say? I mean, at the outside, we should see disclosure six months. Um, uh, well, Dr. Rob has talked about this a lot. And, and, you know, if, if the, you know, if the addict has stopped the behavior, that would be part of that. You know, I, I, I think he tried really within, you know, three to four months to have the disclosure. So, um, yeah. so it would, it would be, you know, it would, I think pulling everybody together and saying, you know, what is the plan? You know, it's fair. I, you know, I've had people, I've had therapists that have waited two years and I, you know, I just go, oh my gosh, that's forever, you know? It's so, closer on everybody involved. You yeah, yeah. I just don't, um, yes. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's fair, you know, to have a, have a reasonable expectation, but you also, you know, you don't want the drip, drip disclosures. You, you, and you want the behavior to stop so that you aren't constantly going, and then there's going to be another disclosure, and then there's going to be another one. So, so um, d disclosure is a challenging aspect. Not everybody goes through a disclosure. Not everybody, you know, decides that that's important, um, you know, to have, but, but a good disclosure, you know, well prepared, well thought out, you know, can be, um, can be very helpful in healing. So, I, but it really feels like the communication with the the four of you, you know, to get a better plan um, might be in order. But you know, I, I realize I only know what's posted in the. No, exactly, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. okay. Next question. Prior to Discovery Day, my addict husband and I would engage in sending one another sexy pics, memes, and flirt. He's been in recovery for a year. Would it tempt him to act out again by sending those types of things again? Is this part of our is this part of our life gone um, forever? Huh. Great question. So, um, I think uh, well, it, it might depend on his circle plan, but but. Overall, I think those kind of patterns um, can be so reminiscent and, and wired in the brain um, that it, it could be a little triggering at first, at least. Uh, I, I'd be cautious about that just because um, we know, I'll back up a minute. We know from scans what uh, the brain of someone looking at porn looks like or what a sex addict acting out looks like. We know that the brain lights up almost in the same way when someone pulls out their phone and starts that the ritual heading toward it long before they've ever ingested a drug or acted out. And so I think um, it takes a long time to kind of pull the plug in all those different uh, triggers and cues, including the phone. The phone is a really powerful and it's almost hardwired into this addictive process. So I'm, I'm really cautious about um, certainly about apps and those kind of things, but but about sexting and so on. Now it sounds like both of you kind of enjoyed that and that flirty behavior, and so uh, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, I think I would encourage you to you know have fun with your sex life and your sexual life and your play. That, that playfulness is a critical aspect of being healthy and, and happy, right? Um, so, but I would just be cautious. I would just you know. We try it, go slowly, but, but I think um, it's a little bit of taking the tiger out for a walk uh, to me. Um, now, he's been uh, in recovery a year, so he, a lot of those triggers may be now kind of gone or dormant, but, but you know, I, I really think it's so terrific that you guys want to have play and have, you know, that, that sensual kind of arousal. That's terrific. Um, just be cautious about it about anything that kind of has an echo with the old addictive behavior um, and phones and pictures do typically. So, um, but, but I would explore and, and carefully and cautiously and, and see how it goes. 
I, and I was thinking I'd have a conversation about this and say, you know, I, I want to check in with you about this. You know, what, what do you see as, you know, healthy boundaries for you? And I mean, with this whole thing, it's so important to have as open and honest communication as you possibly can. Cause you know, I'm, then he gets to think about it and go, you know, I think, I think this might be okay. Let's try it. This might be too much. You know, I'm just, you know, rather than just trying, I would suggest a conversation, you know, about respecting each other's, you know, uh, wishes and desires, but also boundaries. So. And not just one conversation, but I would do it as you go along and, and see how it, how it goes. And by the way, just as a bonus, I think that ability to really communicate with that, at that with each other at that level is going to be great for your relationship. Just those kind of things. That's the real kind of intimate talking that we're talking about to establish that intimacy, reestablish it. Which is really what intimacy is, is open and honest, vulnerable communication. So, right. okay. I moved to my country of origin, uh, leaving my husband with an excuse to visit my family and think, however, he does not respect my boundaries of no contact and continues texting me with random messages about nothing in particular, like weather, food, et cetera. How should I react? I'm not sure I want to continue the marriage. That's a tough one. Yeah, wow. Um, so uh, clearly you laid down a boundary by moving back to your country of origin. Um, uh, I, you know, a lot of these things are so individual. I think, you know, your boundaries, we do have to, the, the boundaries are really the way we heal. And, and so um, I think to maybe establish those boundaries, maybe you have already, um, and perhaps, you know, to talk about what would be appropriate or comfortable from your point of view, in terms of how to communicate, how often. It sounds like he's really trying to reach out and establish uh, stuff just to just have contact. And, and I don't know what his motivation, if he's feeling sorry or just misses you or, or all the above or, or what. So um, maybe it's, uh, my, I'm making this up because I don't know you, but it, it, he may feel like he's been just kind of cut off without a chance to dialogue here. Um, so I don't know about establishing those kind of communications at least once to, to talk about what your needs are and what it's going to take. Um, obviously, you're considering what you might do in terms of your marriage, and I'm sure he's aware of that and needs those feelers and wants his stuff, uh, wants his communication. So um, I don't know. It sounds like it's uh, not working very well because you're bothered by it and he's bothered by it. So perhaps you could maybe establish some boundaries and see if you can both abide by them, particularly him. Well, and I'm looking at this and going, you know, I, I am not sure. I mean, I, I hear that you were clear about the no contact boundary, but it also hears like you use the excuse of visiting family to think rather than saying, you know, I'm going to go visit my family and think about whether I want to be in this marriage or not. I, you know, like I, I go back to the, my last answer is like open and honest communication and say, I need a period of time to think about, you know, whether I want to move forward with you or not. And you intruding on the established boundaries makes me less likely to want to move forward. So, but, but it feels like you were not completely clear uh, on your reason for leaving, uh, uh, you know, to him or that you are. So, so this happens with betrayed partners all the time. They, they, they're told one thing, but the underlying message isn't quite adding up to the same thing. And so there's a disconnect. And I think that, you know, that makes it very challenging. So, um, so I would invite you to be abundantly clear. I've gone to think, I'm thinking about whether I want to be in the marriage. Here's what I'm, you know, here's what I would need to see in order to remain in or whatever you need to do. But, you know, honest, you know, if you want a, a relationship built on a foundation of honesty, it takes both of you to be honest. So, Thoughts? No, I agree with that. I think it's just at establishing uh, what your needs are. And yeah. even say kind of you went as an excuse, but I think, yeah, what, what Tammy said, being very clear cut is going to be important. Yeah. Um, okay. I am in a relationship and I don't have the intense physical attraction uh, to my boyfriend. And this is the first time in a relationship without using my mind and everyone else's tells me he is great for me, but I miss the rush of attraction and the physical attraction I had when I was using. Is that normal? Yeah. So I think that, you know, I think one of the big challenges people have is um, to 
kind of recalibrate that intensity, uh, that interpersonal intensity that you can have uh, that's kind of drug fueled or addiction fueled. And we, we see this often when people try to um, reestablish those feelings, that spark, right? Without, without having the benefit of drugs and alcohol, if they have that history. And so uh, it takes some time to reestablish that. You know, we talk about a 90 day break um, in, in early recovery, but even after that, I've dealt with a lot of guys using methamphetamine who um, really nothing, nothing reemerged because they couldn't quite figure out how to relate to people or be attracted to people. So I'd really um, allow yourself to go without the triggering, without the, certainly you're going without the substances, but um, yeah, that intense physical attraction, it may be that you're looking for something that's not gonna be there in the way it was when you were using. So um, one of the things we work with a lot of the clients who are moving past, especially amphetamines and sex, is to kind of grieve the, the kind of hot, crazy intensity of it. Uh, same thing with romance addiction, by the way, where people get this, um, get, they fall in love with the romance of it or the fantasy of it, but the reality of it gets um, complicated. And so uh, it does come back, I think, to learn how to really um, connect with somebody um, on, on a realistic level um, now. That doesn't mean no, <laughs> no physical attraction. And so I think that I'm a little concerned that um, you're not having that, although um, it, it does take a while to reappear once we get into recovery. So um, I'm not, you don't say how long you're in recovery here. Um, but that rush of attraction, I think sometimes we have to kind of reset our expectations because that rush isn't necessarily- Eight um, months. Okay, eight months, thank you. So, yeah, so I think I, I applaud you for kind of starting to explore that, um, but it, it may, you may experience different in recovery. And not to say that you shouldn't have physical attraction, but I guess the word I'm getting hung up on here is the intense. The intensity piece uh, is really typical for, for those of us in addiction, and it makes it hard to kind of recalibrate sometimes in relationships where we're not using or have no, we're no longer using. And I think it takes some time. Um, but that said, uh, it, it, something should be starting to happen. Um, so uh, as I say, it can go on a little bit in the beginning, but I think it might be something you guys want to talk to a sex therapist or a couple therapist about uh, and see what you could do or what might be going on there. Um, when I've had that sometimes with couples, they, the partner who's in recovery is still um, kind of fantasizing a lot about the intensity of the addictive based relationships um, or some of the aspects in their arousal template that is still addiction based. So uh, I don't know enough to go beyond that, but I, it's something I think I would take to a professional um, if you want some input uh, on that to get some guidance. Okay. I want to pause the recording. <laughs>